Hey, it's my favorite time of year. It's Brimfield time. <laughs> it's a magical time of year. So it's confusing. In this video, I go over some tips for dealers. First time dealers, long time dealers, even just customers. You might get some, might get some enjoyment and help out of this video, but it's really some helpful tips for those thinking of setting up at Brimfield. Let's dive right in. I set up at my first show when I was 14, selling baseball cards. I've owned an antique mall, sold online, set up at the cheapest flea markets, and some of the more expensive indoor walled antique shows. My name is Matt Gregg, and this is the life of a modern antiques dealer. First off, where to set up? Which field? So, Brimfield, unlike some shows, some shows you do, there's one promoter, there's one show, there's one promoter. Brimfield's not really one show. It's 20 shows, or 21 different shows, all happening at the same time in the same small town. So it's 21 different fields, 21 different field promoters, 21 different show promoters, 21 different sets of rules. Some shows are open all week, some shows are open one day. Some shows are like four hour affairs, really. And like I said, some shows you really need to slog it out all seven days to make good money. So depending upon your goals as a dealer and what kind of inventory you have, what kind of price points you have, it's going to vary as to what field you might want to be in. All the fields are different. Some of them are pretty similar. Some of them are very similar, but some of them are vastly different. And all this plays a role into which field you want to be in. And so like any show, you have to contact the show promoter as a dealer, and they'll send you a contract. Years ago, when I first started doing Brimfield, it seemed like every, even though it was quite a ways into the internet age, every promoter had to hand mail you a contract. You had to fill it out by hand, send it back with a check. But thankfully, thankfully, some promoters have caught up and at the very least, they email you a contract now, but some of them have them online. Some of them have forms you can fill out right online and pay right online, and bam, off you go. So you got to contact the promoter of the field you want to do. Find out if they have space available. This late in the game, a lot of fields are sold out, but some fields are very big and will never sell out. So there's definitely still space available if you're on the fence and you want to set up. You can find a field to set up in now. But how to choose that field? I can't tell you what field is the best because there's several that are the best, and there's several that to me are the worst, but could be good for a certain type of dealer. So it depends on your price points. Yeah, it depends on your price points. Are you a wholesale dealer? Are you looking more for retail? You know, one of the one of the one day shows is typically more of a wholesale kind of field. And it's, it's over in four hours. So it's hard to maybe get a lot of retail dollars out of that. It's also harder in those shows to sell $20 objects. Do you have a lot of 20 and 10 and $5 objects? Do you do a whole table of dollar objects? That's going to be tough to make enough money in one of those sort of four hour window shows that opens and closes within, like I say, four hours to sell enough to make that. But some of the cheaper week long fields, that's stuff's perfect for those fields where you're just relying on sort of retail crowd flowing in and buying stuff here and there every single day. Those kind of items can work there. You can probably make a real good, real good week, real good living selling that type of stuff. That's not personally what I do, but it is a thing people do at Brimfield. Booths, of course, cost different amounts in different fields. So you have to check into that, figure out what your price point is, is how much you're willing to pay for a booth. Picking a field depends on your type of merchandise too. It's not like, just about any merchandise can sell in just about any field. But there are some fields that seem to do better for one type of thing or some fields that do better in something else. For instance, vintage clothes. Dealer's Choice has a whole pavilion full of vintage clothes and vintage jewelry dealers. Heart of the Mart has a whole tent of vintage clothing dealers. Um, Hertans has several vintage clothing dealers sort of clustered, to, clustered together. And I don't know, there's a field on the northeast end of town. I'm not even sure exactly what field that is. That's a huge tent with nothing but vintage clothing. So if you're a vintage clothing dealer, you might want to go into one of those areas and be with like-minded vendors because you know customers are seeking those areas out. But then you might also think, hey, I want to be like the only vintage clothes dealer on my aisle or on my row. And so you might want to go into a different field for that. Quaker Acres has a, uh, a neat mix, but they have a lot of sort of people doing that like Country, country style, country living style, primitive, especially like maybe things that have been remade into something else for decorative purposes. They have a lot of those type of dealers. And again, maybe you don't want to be with those dealers or maybe you do want to be with those dealers. Stevens Place, The Meadows, I get kind of confused as to where one of those fields ends and the other begins, but there's some dealers back there with really big decorative objects. I'm talking like stuff you need a forklift or four or five men to load into a truck. And so they have big wide aisles for trucks to pull in and stuff. That's a perfect field for that sort of stuff. So you want to take those points into consideration. You know, what's your price point of your merchandise? How much of it do you need to sell to have a good week? 
can you sell enough of that in a four hour window? Are you more of a retail type vendor versus a wholesale vendor? Are you getting, are you going up there to get rid of a bunch of stuff so you're selling at a cost? That's all gonna kind of factor into what field you wanna pick. Another thing is, what's your main point for being in Brimfield? Several of my friends, they go up there, they're, they save sort of all year long. They do maybe four or five shows total a year, and three of them are Brimfield. So they're saving their best of their best. They're looking to go up there and have a great week selling. Me personally and a bunch of my other friends, we're going up there more to buy than to sell. So we want to do a one show, make some money, get rid of some stuff, and then have space in our van and money in our pocket to go into a different field and buy more stuff to take home and try to sell. So if you're strictly there to sell, then you probably want to pick maybe a longer field, a field that has more than one day. If you're there looking to mostly buy and just sell enough to sort of what I used to do I wanted to sell enough to pay for my hotel the profit from sales pay for my hotel and pay for my gas and that way the buying was free if you're trying to do that you might want to be in one of the one day shows because then you have the rest of the days to shop over the years I've set up at several fields I started with Hart then my friend did dealer's choice so I ended up moving down to dealer's choice set up right next to him and we would go up primarily because we were looking to buy so Dealer's Choice was perfect. It was basically almost like a four-hour show, really. You know, start setting up when they would open the gates at like 7. The show would open to, I think, the general public at 11. And then by 12 or 1, it was pretty much over, and everyone was heading across the street to that field opening. For us, there were some years where I made 95% of my money before it was open to the general public. Other years where the general public... I sold more to them than I did during setup, but it worked out with the two of us because one of us could maybe watch the booth during setup and the other one could run around and shop and then vice versa. I didn't do a ton of buying there. I would buy a few things during setup. I primarily bought from my few neighbors, including my friend, and we were sort of next to a couple of Pennsylvania dealers and I would buy from them. Dealers that I knew from doing shows and stuff in Pennsylvania. For a few years, I even did the double. I set up a dealer choice on Tuesday and then Mays would roll around. I would set up again. I'd spend all, all day Wednesday shopping. Tuesday evening shopping, go and set up at Maze. Never really quite worked out for me uh, sales-wise, even though I would always save a few tubs of merch that didn't come out. I would always put out the stuff I just bought. Just didn't quite work out for me. I, I like the idea of hitting you know, more of the retail crowd or the bigger crowds that come at the end of the week. Dealer's Choice, you know, Tuesday. It's a, Tuesday's a big day because all the fields open, but it's also a lot of competition because all the fields open at once. So I don't know. It uh, it sort of grew on me. I was thinking about moving. I was I I did really well in the beginning, and then sort of sales got a little bit worse and a little bit worse. And I just I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. My friend no longer wanted to or could go up. So then that meant the hotel cost was all on my own. And around the same time, the Hurtans changed ownership, and they put they put up a fence now, so they eliminate people walking through early during setup. The two fields I bought the most on were Hurtans and Hart. Now I realized I could set up at one of those and still shop the other one, which was always a fear. I didn't want to lose shopping the other one. So now I can set up at Hurtans. I can set up early. I can close my tent. I can go over to Hart and Wednesday morning shop and come back and be ready for when the field opens. Dealer Choice always worked well for me, uh, partly because it was so cheap. And I think it was like $195 for the booth. And you get three you get three dealer badges and if you can sell two of them now you're down to like a hundred dollars or so in your booth and it's not hard to make enough money at a hundred dollar booth the problem was the hotel cost and the gas cost and everything else but you see you go to these some of these other field openings and you think man, man these places are packed so of course the grass is always greener on the other side but yeah last year i made the switch moved over to her tans worked out well because i can i can pay rent or i can rent a tent set up the tent unload all my merchandise in there and just sleep in my van and save money on hotel that way. And then I'm right there in the morning, no traveling, none of that nasty traffic. So yeah, that's my that's my plan now. But there's a lot of good fields. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of mediocre fields, but there's a lot of good fields. And what type of dealer you are, what type of merchandise you're selling, your price points are all gonna factor into what field you wanna be in, how much you wanna shop should also factor in. So those are all things you wanna think about when you pick what field to be in. Tip number two though, how much stuff do you bring? This is of course where what type of type of dealer you are, what field you're in matters. If you're in one of those fields, if you're in dealer's choice and it's over and done with so quickly, and you're also up there looking mainly to buy stuff as well, you can't come with a pack van. It takes too long to unload, too long to set up. By the time you're done doing all that, the crowds come through and gone. Same with Maze. You know, Maze is they let the buyers in and they let you unload your merchandise. So if you have a very full packed van, it's going to be hard to get it all set up while everyone's running around. Before you know it, the day's over and you're still setting up. So the type of field you're in is going to impact this decision. 
you're more of a wholesale field, you probably want to bring less stuff. If you're a wholesale field, you also don't want to bring a lot of little trinkets because they just don't sell well enough. $10, $5 objects. You, you kind of want to just bring the meat. But if you're in a week-long field, you want to have a lot of $5 and $10 and $20 objects probably because that's a lot of crowd that that's all they buy. And if you're going to sit there all week, you want to be selling a lot of stuff. And I personally don't carry a lot of stuff in the $5, $10 range, but I have $20, $25 objects. And you want to have those and sort of fill out your tables and just keep selling and unloading and sell more. If you're looking to buy a lot, you got to go up with a half empty van that we have space to fill it. Also, just for a tip for packing, remember the last stuff you put on is the first stuff to come off. So when you pull into your booth and you're starting to set up, the first thing you want to pull off is your tent or your tables. They need to be in the back of the truck, right there, the doors open. You can pull them right out and throw them up. I see so many dealers. It's just crazy how many dealers have to unpack half their load before they get to their tables. And then they got to move stuff to put the tables up. And But they really wanted to put the tables up first and then unload right onto the tables. You're just making too many steps for yourself. Save the steps. Unload it as simple as possible. So you got to load it with that in mind. Put the tables out first. Then you can unload the stuff right on top of tables and not have to move it around 10 times. You don't want to move something three times before it's finally set up. Idea number three, how to set up. Do you want to have a really neatly organized booth? Or do you just want to throw it all out there and let customers root for it? Root through it. Root for it. Root through it. That's also going to depend on what field you're in. If you're in one of the more wholesale fields, you don't have time to set it up perfectly. That show is over in four hours. you got to get it out of the truck, onto the ground, onto the table, ready for people to look at. Now, I'm not saying you want it to be messy or just throwing stuff on the ground, although that's a strategy people do too. They just throw it out the truck and let you figure it out as a buyer, and they'll have a huge crowd around them. But I've seen it every year at Dealer's Choice. There'd be some poor slob that's never set up in that field before. They pull in. They're taking their time setting up in the morning. They're putting everything out perfectly. The, the crowd of dealers buying during setup passes them by because they're not quite set up yet. They don't have everything out. They're taking too long. Next thing you know, they're still setting up when the 11 o'clock and the doors open. The gate opens as it is at 11. They're still setting up. Next thing you know, by 1 o'clock, the show's thinned out so much, they're barely set up. And you think, what were you doing? Like, you've missed the, the day. It's over now. So... If you're, you're going to do it like that, you need to be in one of those fields that's going to be there all week so you can keep selling and kind of justify the work and setting it up. Tip number four, pricing. Are you going to have everything stickered? Are you going to just yell out random numbers when people ask about something? People do different strategies. Um, I personally, I don't have the memory for everything, so I like to have stuff stickered. But I know a lot of my friends, you know, they're wholesaling the stuff. They might have had this in a design shop outside in New York City for $2,000, but they paid 500 for it and then now they're looking to blow it out sell it get rid of it get money coming in buy something else so they're trying to get maybe trying to get six hundred dollars out of it maybe they're trying to get four hundred dollars out of it so they don't want to they don't want to leave it priced at two grand because no one's really going to ask hey can will you take 75 percent off this thing so a lot of times they don't even price they just remove the price tags the old price tags but that's tricky because this crowd rushes in you might have five people in your booth at once asking about something so you know, it works if you don't have hundreds and hundreds of items in your booth, but it's tricky if you have a lot of items. If you're there a week long, kind of doing the whole retail kind of crowd, then you want to have stuff priced. Because a lot of people, you know, they might be willing to pay 20, but they have no idea if you're asking 200 or you're asking 10. So they won't ask. But, you know, every dealer has their own philosophy on this, but you got to kind of want to know that ahead of time. Because if you're planning on pricing stuff during setup, it won't happen or it won't happen easily. It'll just take too long. So if you're gonna if you wanna have the stuff priced, you almost need to bring it priced because it's tricky unless you're in a field like like her tans where you can start unloading on Monday into your tent where no one can shop and you can kinda of slowly set up and price stuff. But if you're in one of those fields that the crowd's walking around while you're setting up, you're gonna have a hard time stickering stuff. Tip number five, also pricing. What do I mean? Well, Retail versus wholesale. Everyone shopping in Brimfield is just about as a dealer. They're all looking for dealer prices. And the ones who aren't dealers, they're all looking for the best deals. Depending upon what field you're in, I've already talked about this, but if you're in one of the shorter fields, those are known as wholesale fields. It's trickier to get retail dollars out of that. So if, if you're the kind of dealer who is, I mean, hopefully you know what kind of dealer you are, but if you're a dealer who relies on getting sort of every last dollar out of something, you need to consider what field you're gonna be in beforehand. And then just the price points too. What works for you? Um, I know there's vendors up there who do those big tables, eight foot tables, full thing. Everything's a dollar or everything's five dollars, and it works for them. But personally, that would not work for me. That'd be too. I have a van. I don't have one of those big box trucks. I'm not renting a big box truck, 
And so I just don't have the space in my van to justify tubs full of stuff that I'm selling for a dollar or even selling for five dollars each. I just wouldn't sell enough of it to feel like I made any money for that much space in my van. Whereas, you know, one tub could have two pieces of pottery in it that are five hundred or eight hundred or a thousand dollars or whatever. That to me is a lot easier than a tub full of five dollar thing. Tip number six, food and drinks. Yeah, there's a lot of food vendors in Brimfield. Of course, most fields only have one food vendor and they get packed at lunch. So if you're there by yourself and you're gonna have your neighbor watch your stall while you run you know, run over to the food vendor, there could be a line. Or if you're gonna run down to the food court, it could take you forever to get down to the food court and back. My advice is pack some snacks. You don't wanna leave your booth during the lunch rush because even if it's not busy where you're at, it might be busy at the lunch, the food stalls, and you could just be there 30 minutes standing in line. Pack some drinks, drinks get pricey. It'll add up quickly three, four days, seven days in, I would pack definitely drinks and snacks. It might be hard to bring real food with a cooler or maybe you don't have a big enough cooler, but you gotta pack some of that stuff, save some money and save the time and hassle of running down and buying it. Unless, like you said, you're there with two people, in which case that's a lot easier to send one person down for a food run. I unfortunately am there by myself. Last year, the dealer next to me were both by themselves. So it was three of us in a row all by ourselves. So that made it hard to get food. Seven, are you camping out? Camping out, sleeping in your truck, get in a hotel. You need to decide that. If you're planning on sleeping in your van, you probably want to pick a field with a shower. I think a lot of fields have showers. I can only speak to the ones I've done. I know Hart has showers. Hart has probably the nicest showers in Broomfield. Hertans has this like shower camper truck that comes in. Very nice. Not quite as nice as Hart, but very nice. Even Dealer's Choice has a single shower for the whole field. But I mean, 10 people maybe camp out. So when I was, the one time I slept on the field and I slept in the very front of my truck because I could not unload the stuff yet. It was raining that night, but not the next day. So I left everything on the van. I just slept across the two front seats. I had front seat, cooler front seat. And my idea was to use a furniture pad over top of the cooler to make it soft, but then it made it higher than the seats, which I didn't realize. So then it was like a little hump. It didn't work out well, but, but in the morning when I woke up stiff and sore, which I did because I couldn't sleep. I had a shower, so that was nice. I know a lot of people uh, camp out in Quaker Acre, so I assume there's showers there, but I can't speak to it for sure. I think Mays has showers. I have no idea about auction acres. But yeah, if you're planning on camping out, you might want to contact. That might be something you do before you pick a field is find out which field have showers and which ones don't. Assuming you want a shower. I don't know. Maybe you don't want a shower. I personally like a shower. It wakes me up. I don't like the smell. There's enough smelly people at Brimfield. I don't need to be one of them. But hey, if you want to be one of them, you do you. Camping out though, are you planning on cooking your food in your booth, doing something like that? You're going to need a couple coolers. But if you don't have the space in your van, you're just like, oh, I'm just going to buy food from the food stalls. They close early. This caught me by, by surprise. I went down there like 5 o'clock last year, and like one vendor was open the one night. So I had no choice for dinner, just that one. So yeah, you might want to plan that in advance. You know, you got to think about that. What food vendors will still be there at five as the day's winding down or six as the day's winding down? Get there before they close. Get that last meal in, especially if you're not doing like the, the cookout, the camp stove type thing. If your truck's boxed in, it's hard to leave. Yeah, but if you have your van at the back of the field or your other car or a second car, or maybe you're friends with your neighbor next to you or become friends with your neighbor next to you, maybe he's gonna make a run to Walmart or make a run over to Sturbridge for dinner and then you can tag along. But that's when you need that second vehicle or you need a vehicle Nah, not boxed in by all your merch like mine is. Finally, don't forget, yeah, don't forget all these things. I don't know how helpful this is. Some of this might be obvious to you, but it's it's hilarious to me how many people I know forget some of this stuff. You might wanna bring boots or at least a change of shoes. If you're walking around in the morning, I don't know, dealer's choice, heart of the mark, those, those fields have a lot of grass and those grass has a lot of dew and your feet get soaking wet. So bring some boots, especially if you're planning on leaving your field and shopping. Sunscreen. This, of course, is good for buyers, too. <laughs> it's a lot of time sitting out there, and depending upon the shade level, a lot of fields have no shade. You're just going to bake. Pack some sunscreen. Change. Yeah, people pay with cash. You might be nice to have some change. Especially if you sell a lot of stuff under $20, you'll be given a lot of $20 bills. So you need, you need the fives, and you need the ones, and you need the tens. Try to bring that, because everyone's always scrambling for, for bills. Fully charged phone. I would, I would bring a fully charged phone. <laughs> Charge every time, every chance you get. Hey, up by the showers, there's a plug over there. Plug your phone in and get it fully charged. You're gonna need it. Receipt book. Maybe a customer wants a receipt. Do you write receipts? Maybe you don't write receipts and if you don't, forget that. But pack a receipt book. Get that little doohickey to run credit cards through your phone. 
try to remember to bring it. it. Makes it easier to use it. Bring some extra price tags. Unless you just don't plan on pricing anything, you'd be surprised how many price tags fall off during setup. Bring some extra price tags, reprice the stuff. Might save you from answering the same question 50 times. Bring some bags and wrapping paper. Yeah, you're planning on selling stuff. Bring the bags and wrapping paper. Don't ask me for them. Every year, my neighbor asks me for them. Not every year, because last year I switched. But yeah, someone, I'm not going to say names, John, but someone would always forget one of those things and need me. I never forget those because I just leave them in my van between shows, from one show to the next. Yeah, bring some pens. You got to fill out those price tags. You got to fill out that receipt book. Bring some pens. You might want to bring some towels. You might want to bring some paper towels. It could be wet. It could be rainy. Bring some paper towels, especially if you're showering. Bring some paper towels. If you're showering, you might want to take sandals. I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I don't go into weird showers without wearing sandals. But, hey, you want athlete's foot, you be, you do you. Go get that athlete's foot. I don't care. But, yeah, those are just some hints, some tips. I'm sure I missed some stuff. I spent a lot of time writing this down. I hope I got it all. But uh, if I didn't, let me know in the comments below what I missed or what you think I missed or what I should have put in the video. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. Check out my other contact. Content. Content. Check out my other content. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. See you in Broomfield.